Professor Prahta Bhanumeta needs no introduction to anyone here. But uh, just perhaps we should remind ourselves that we were also fortunate to have him here as a colleague for a brief while uh, in the 19... Eight, 2000s. 2000s. Oh, okay, 2000s. <laughs> uh, he subsequently went on to the Center for Policy Research where he served uh, for a fairly long time and is now, as you all know, the Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University. But he's also known uh, for very, very penetrating insights into our times, really, I, I would say. And um, especially in the recent past, I think. Uh, uh, a lot of his writing has displayed some of the um, the courage and the uh, willingness to look through a lot of miasma into uh, s to search for clarity in increasingly uncertain and as Sona said peculiar times, which I, I believe Krishna herself would have appreciated. So I think he's a very fitting person to deliver the lecture this year, and we're very very glad to welcome him. Uh, I must confess, shall I just uh, take this picture, some of whom are here, if I'm not mistaken, Professor Romila Thapar. Uh, it's not even a case of kind of dwarfs standing on shoulders of giants. It's like sort of, you know, uh, dwarfs standing astride, uh, really big figures. So I don't feel quite up to the task. Uh, also, I think at this particular moment, where the stress on our academic life generally, not just in India, but globally, I think there is something happening to higher education which we do need to discuss, and I'll perhaps briefly touch upon, uh, where the task of trying to snatch snippets of intellectual order and illumination from a chaotic and unfathomable and difficult world, with some degree of integrity and credibility seems to be really under question. Even the very idea of doing that, uh, I think, seems to be under question. So I think that, that context, you know, what are we doing all of this stuff for? Um, I'm also intimidated because I'm vice chancellor. And as you know, vice chancellors are not supposed to be able to think. And I hope I won't uh, dis display, that, uh, display that virtue uh, tonight. But most of all, most of all, for the per person um, whose life and work we are here to comm commemorate, uh, Professor Krishna Bhardwaj, I did not have the pleasure of knowing her, but I do feel an affinity for her in very many ways. Uh, many people remember her work on Srafa, her work on Indian agriculture. Actually, her first book, I think, was on the Indian railways. Um, it's quite, uh, uh, quite a remarkable piece of work, I think, in the history of thinking about transport um, uh, economics in India. But my affinity with her comes from the fact that she absolutely loved classical political economy. Uh, her major contribution was to emphasize the continuing relevance of classical political economy, even in an age dominated by neoclassical economics. And the depth of her engagement with economists from the 17th to the 19th century is truly astounding. Uh, I mean, she wrote brief books but it's the kind of brevity that's won by deep insight and scholarship. As Thuro used to say, you know, if I had more time, I'd write shorter books. Uh, that kind of wisdom distilled into, particularly her RC, that lectures. And there are four great lessons of her work, which I have, a, you might say, personal sympathy with, affinity with. First, the claim, which does need reiterating over and over again, particularly in these times that economic development cannot be understood just through models that get prices right or concentrate on exchange. It has to take into account a whole range of structural social conditions from property relations, institutional settings, and power dynamics that affect our agency as economic agents. And, and it is quite striking how much a pioneer she was in making, making that claim. Second, the way she thought about agency and freedom itself was profoundly ahead of its time. She directed our attention to the fact that choice should not be treated as a formal fiction or merely a subjective preference, but we need a better account of the objective constraints that shape our choices. Third, she had an interest, and in, in, you know, this was one of her major theoretical contributions, you might say, in a kind of disequilibrium economics. Her engagement with the work of a figure I personally drew a lot of inspiration for from in my work on Adam Smith, uh, Albert Hirschman, 
and particularly Albert Hirschman's idea that development is almost always uneven and opportunistic. But I think Krishna Bharadwaj's critique of Hirschman's, uh, you might say, subtle defense of uneven development uh, was quite powerful in terms of being able to point out what are the conditions under which that kind of opportunistic and uneven development, where you sort of learn by doing and transcend your previous mistakes, can actually lead into sustained poverty traps. And finally, something she emphasized over and over again, uh, which in these times matters a lot, which is a historical and empirical approach to theorizing. She was a powerful theorist. But for her, in a sense, theory did not predetermine her approach to history or to economic development. Uh, she was always mindful of, there's only one great question in social science, right, which is about everything you can ask one question, which is under what conditions, right? And if we took that question seriously, I think you would come with a form of social science, perhaps thinking in humanistic, humanistic studies, that would, I think, avoid too many straw men debates, too many false generalizations, or let's say premature generalizations that have, I think, dented the credibility of our academic life. I think at some point we'll have to shine a light on ourselves, which is ask the difficult question, what is it about the forms of knowledge that we produce, right? Apart from its, the political story is often easy to tell. That's a surface story, right? That leads people to be suspicious of what we are doing. Is there something about our practice which is not true to our vocation. And I think her work, this insistence, under what conditions, under what conditions, under what conditions, right? That was a critique of Srafa, that's a critique of Hirschman, uh, I think is a really sort of salutary uh, 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 lesson. My temperament and sensibilities are very different from her and obviously in capabilities can't even uh, uh, match her. Uh, <laughs> She remained, in, she, in the end for her, the classical political economy tradition culminated in Marx. Uh, I'm more Smithian in sensibility, which is to say that I do think the world is a lot more tragic uh, than Marx uh, uh, probably would admit. That we are condemned to a series of dualisms which we will not entirely overcome. And it is hard to imagine a home, a world as a home in which we are fully reconciled. I've never quite bought that vision of emancipation. Uh, I also happen to think that a certain degree of alienation from the world is actually productive. Uh, it is what prevents us from assuming Promethean godlike powers and a sense of omniscience about how to change the world. Perhaps it leads to an interest in politics that is more boring, uh, perhaps one that is wedded to more indirect, incremental, artful amelioration than grand fantasies uh, and it is boring i'll have to admit right doesn't have that excitement i think of the structural transformations that she talks about and the second difference and which is what i'll talk about a little bit today uh, in trying to connect it to contemporary politics is fundamentally i've had an interest in what you might call moral psychology even my interest in classical political economy, Adam Smith, was primarily an in, in interest in the moral psychology underlying it. And I've always believed, I mean, just to lay out a kind of general proposition, just to kind of provoke argument, that human beings have a psychic complexity that cannot be reduced to either material forces or the institutional configurations under which they find themselves. The language of interiority of the human passions, jealousy, envy, pride, fear, vanity, ego, that enormously rich pa vocabulary of the passions that makes us the human beings that we are, is something that we have in a sense almost eclipsed from contemporary social science. And what was great about classical political economy for me was, was the centrality of that language. Contrary to Hirschman, Adam Smith did not say that interests eclipse passions. It was, it was quite the contrary. You know, interests underline the formal theory. Passions, you know, as a fear, envy, jealousy, pride, all the kinds of things that you see at work in our human relationships, in our politics, right? Uh, 
play a central role in thinking about the world. That there's an autonomy to the human psyche, right? That we still don't fully understand, but which is still not entirely exhausted by our grasp of our material conditions. <laughs> For me, the, the argument I'm going to make today is that the period Krishna Bharadwaj studied with such great acumen, right, the rise of political economy from the 17th to the 19th centuries, uh, and it's really truly remarkable work. I'd, I'd urge you to read it if you haven't, right? was also the period of the rise of another of modernity's great hopes. So not just questions of value and distribution, but something that we broadly call the public sphere. And I'm going to speak in somewhat untheorized terms. I know there are wonderful political theorists sitting in the audience, Nivedita, uh, others who can give you a much more nuanced theoretical account of what I'm trying to do. But 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 this hopefully will facilitate a a a a, a, a a broader conversation um, uh, in, in some ways, that there was a hope that along with the rise of classical political economy, what would emerge as a counterweight to it is the rise of a very distinctive public sphere, which would be the site of a very distinctive kind of politics. And there are many theoretical articulations of it. I mean, Habermas's structural transformation of the public sphere, for example, right? M many of you are familiar with. And there are many critiques of that idea. The idea that the public sphere is this space uncom uncontaminated by relations of power, that it's this space of pure intersubjectivity, right? Where we can actually freely thinking as free and equal beings come up with norms that govern us. Of course we know that that is an ideal, that is not a sociological description. But the fact of the matter is that I think almost every classical thinker that she talked about, Adam Smith in particular as well, surprisingly, uh, if you read the theory of moral sentiments, did think that something like that space of a public sphere, right, what we are enacting here today, or at least what we think we are enacting here today, right, would be a good counterweight to, as it were, the logic of material interests. And I think at this point, at this juncture, when we are thinking about the crisis of politics, not just globally, but specifically in India, it is worth asking what happens to that idea of the public sphere. Is that space where we can, we can think politically, right? And I'll talk about what I mean politically in a minute. Is that space just a pipe dream, right? Are we sort of chasing phantoms, right? that are impossible in our circumstances. Now, just one more preliminary remark before I elaborate on this argument and uh, 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 what I mean by that, that space of politics. When we normally think about Indian politics at this point, right, or the crisis of politics, uh, one can evoke several incomplete transitions, right? Or you might say stuck transitions that haunt our politics. And I just want to mention them just to set them aside. We can discuss them at some later point, which is the first transition is, uh, you might say, a transition from crony capitalism to well-regulated markets. Or if you want to put it more deeply, a new configuration of the relationship between public and private power in the economic sphere. The second is a transition from populism to social democracy when it comes to the welfare state. The third is the creation of a state that can mediate the former two relationships by being a high capacity state. So how do you make the transition from a low capacity to a high capacity state? And by capacity, I mean all the things that you need to associate with the state, including rule of law and a space for politics. Right? Finally, a transition that takes us in our individual subjectivities from the tyranny of all kinds of compulsory identities, right? It does not emancipate us from identities. I mean, there's a recent controversy, you know, Ramgo has, 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 has generated in the Indian Express. And my own view is, for what it's worth, is that liberalism is the view that the identities you have should not matter to the rights that you possess. It, does, it is not the view that in order to possess rights, 
you should not have identities. Right? But the transition from what we call compulsory identities, legislated identities, right? identities where other people define who we are, whether it's legal categories, whether it's the process of politics, we can't but be what we are. Right? The transition from thinking about identity that way to thinking of zones of freedom. Right? And the failure of our democracy on all of these four transitions right, is something that you might say is leading to a sense of gloom and darkness. The vacuum is filled by a divisive nationalism, right? which is paradoxical, because at one level, this divisive nationalism is capacious in its reach. There is no question that the BJP has a astonishing social base. Let's not underestimate what it meant for Indian politics. But despite it, or so some might argue because of its capacious social base, it has exacerbated almost all the other contradictions in Indian society between rural and urban, Dalit, non-Dalit, North and South, majorities and minorities. Right? My own view is that I think the democratic worm will turn. I think you're beginning to see signs of this. Uh, democracy is, is very hard to control uh, beyond a point. Uh, I think that democratic faith is something that we should not give up on and, and you know, it's not just a leap of faith. I, I think there's good evidence uh, to argue for it. Right? Nevertheless, nevertheless, I think there's no point minimizing the threat, as it were, the failure of those four transitions and the place of nationalism to fill that vacuum has taken. Right? But when we describe politics, and this was the title I've used for this talk, you know, politics in dark times, at this moment, I think we have something more in mind or something else is going on in our society that is not captured by those conventional political and economic narratives, right? I know dark times have to be historically made contingent. Different people experience them differently. Different sections of society experience them differently. They have to be spatialized in many parts of our society. Large sections of people are perhaps for the first time seeing prospects of material well-being, while many others are being deprived of it. So there is an une unevenness and complexity to characterizing that India that I'll just, I'll just again gesture and put aside. What I do want to talk about right, is a sense of dark times that we have that is more diffuse, insidious, almost moral psychological and dare I say, almost neurotic and melancholic. I don't have the skills of, again, many JNU faculty. I think P.O. Dev Kumar might do a wonderful job finding the light, right literary or uh, theoretical register uh, to talk about this. But when I think of dark times, right, I think of something very specific going on. And I think that is what Hannah Arendt was alluding to when she used the term dark times. Right? Her use of the phrase dark times was taken itself from a poem, as you know, from Bertolt Brecht's, right? uh, who she continued to admire despite Brecht's appalling Stalinism. And Brecht's poem, many of you will remem remember the lines, goes something like this. Truly I live in dark times. An artless, artless world is foolish. An artless word is foolish. A smooth forehead points to insensitivity. He who laughs has not received the terrible news. And in this poem, Brecht is gesturing to two things. Right? One is, of course, to the plain fact of insensitivity. He who laughs has not received the terrible news. Somehow, well, you know, there's that Hindi song, right? Hansi bhi humne udhar pe le rakhi hai, right? That you sometimes feel in these times, right? That laughing is in some sense is something you're not entitled to. You've probably not heard the terrible news. But the other register in this poem that Brecht evokes, which is what I think concerned Arendt, is based on this line, even an artless world can be foolish. Uh, can be foolish. 
what would it mean to live in a time where the possibility of communication seems to be increasingly extinguished? This is a different question from the question of our liberties being suppressed. Right? Is power being exercised over people? You know, that comes and goes as societies develop. Right? But even those questions often assume a common frame of, frame of reference. Even the distinction between truth and lying, right, or accusing someone of lying, assumes some sense of what is truth and what is lying. But imagine you placed yourself in a political discourse where every utterance, right, the only thing you could guarantee about that utterance was that it was going to be misunderstood. Right? The only thing you could guarantee about that utterance, right, that it made sense, but it shares no common reference. Right? What is the sense of darkness right, that that kind of a public sphere produces in you? Right? We have a lot of talk, we have a lot of contention, right? despite the state's attempts to regulate control in some ways, uh, it's not been able to. Right? So what is the sense of disquiet? And the sense of disquiet I would uh, urge you to think about, and that's what I'll elaborate on in the next 10-15 minutes is the sense that the great hope of modernity, this public sphere, right, where we could communicate in however inchoate forms, but the idea of communication itself made some sense, right? We worried about who had access to this. We worried about which power relations structured it. But what would it mean to be constantly speaking a language that's misunderstood? Hannah Arendt's own work, I think her sense of dark times, I think was informed by this profound sense of a breakdown in the public sphere. Uh, when she used the phrase dark times, she was of course referring to totalitarian societies. Right? And I don't want to make easy, invidious comparisons. But Arendt herself pointed out to the fact, as she said, it may be that the predicaments of our time, referring to what dark times means, will assume their authentic form, though not necessarily the most cruelest, only when totalitarianism becomes a thing of the past. Okay? So what did she mean by this? I think what concerned her most of all, right? and I think this is a good guide to the predicament of our politics faces is what would happen to a public sphere where the relationship between truth and politics got distorted. Right? Now this turns out to be a much trickier psychological problem than we recognize. Because there's one construction of this problem which is an intellectually easy construction. There are some people who are lying. There are some people who are engaging in false propaganda. Right? Let us expose their lies. Let us expose their false propaganda. Right? Okay. Truth is not guaranteed to win. But at least the conceptual framework understands this distinction. Right? Arendt's concern was much deeper. And, and, and I actually feel that kind of psychologically playing out, not exactly in her words, in the predicaments we face. It was much deeper, first of all, because she realized that politics is almost always already in the realm of post-truth, right? Why is politics almost already in the realm of post-truth? She saw politics as, in a sense, inhabiting this nether zone between two forms of truth. On the one hand, you might say that bare factual truths there is a bottle on the table. In order for me to be able to communicate this truth to you, presumably you understand the conditions under which this claim might be true or something like that. 
right? Politics needs these factual truths as an anchor, right? Otherwise, how is even communication possible? But these kinds of truths are not the stuff of politics, right? The stuff of politics begins when I say, who gets to drink this water? What are the norms appropriate to using it? So there's factual truth. Again, I'm oversimplifying. Or there is what you might say normative or philosophical truth, right? The kind political theorists, ideologues conjure up all the time. We think this is the best society. We think this is a just political order, right? The challenge for politics and truth and the relationship between politics and truth is that it cannot re take recourse to either notions of truth. You might say, to put it provocatively, politics begins where truth ends. Because if the matter could be settled by truth, there would be no need for politics. Right? Okay? If we all agreed, right, that almost everything we debated while like this proposition, there's a bottle on the table, there'd be no need for politics. Right? Right? And Arendt's great insight, not her alone, but I think it's true of other liberal thinkers in the 20th century, is politics operates not in the realm of validity, but in the realm of legitimacy. Right? The gap between validity and legitimacy right, is the zone that politics by its very nature occupies. And actually, that's what makes politics a zone of freedom. Right? If we all agreed, where would there be difference? Where would there be plurality? Right? If we all agreed, what would the multiplicity of agency mean? Right? But the very conditions that make politics possible, plurality, agency, contingency, are the very conditions that make the relationship between politics and truth more complicated. Right? And Arendt's concern was, given that politics does not occupy the space of truth, it occupies the space of legitimacy, what would it mean to create a common political sphere under conditions of plurality that is not simply reduced to combat? Right? Because if politics is all about combat, then the premise of politics is that there is no communication possible. Right? Right. The premise of politics is, to use Schmidt's term, it's all about friends and enemies. Right. Now, maybe factually a appealing description of politics, but what would it be like to live a sphere where, a, a life where every single element you encountered in your social world had that character? Right. And that's the sense of neurosis you sometimes feel about politics at this moment. Right? Now, Arendt went further, and I'm just now using thinking with her to use her phrase rather than sort of describing her argument. Right? She said at a psychological level, the relationship between truth and politics becomes even more problematic if you ask the question, who has an interest in truth? Right? It's almost a Nietzschean question. It's not about what is truth. Why should we care about the truth? What would happen to a culture if it actually genuinely internalized that thought? Right? Okay. But what was prescient about her analysis of the public sphere was that this impulse to question the truth and question the value of truth actually comes not so much from the liars. Right? Even the liar acknowledges there is such a thing as truth. It does not come so much from the propagandists. Its deeper source comes from some of the very things that we like as political agents. Right? The first is this paradox of truth in modern societies. I think Bernard Williams put it most powerfully. So the paradox of modern society is that on the one hand, 
modern societies display an incredible commitment to truth right all of us in universities if you ask in the social science and humanities what are we past masters at we are past masters at unmasking illusion right right we have this will not to be deceived right right all of you are at jnu partly because you want to do that unmasking right this incredible drive to live a life without illusions without masks right and yet there is something about this drive and process itself that also makes us very skeptical about the truth at the end so everybody is busy unmasking everybody else right and yet if you ask most people what is your conception of truth good chances are you probably get a relapse into subjectivism or relativism right and this is the existential dilemma of your politics in some ways right that what explains this extraordinary relentlessness extremism and relentlessness right turns into its very opposite right that's in a sense if you like a philosophical psychological dilemma the second thing that arden grasped and i think there is something about this captures our at, at our moment quite well truth and freedom have a very problematic relationship to each other we like to think truth sets us free right you've heard that phrase truth sets you truth will set you free right you will sleep well if you live a life of truthfulness it's true certainly i think there is something to it but what happens if a culture begins to think of truth as coercive when nietzsche talked about dark times the cultural crisis that was the backdrop to the rise of totalitarianism right his present psychological insight was just this as i said he was not interested in debating what is truth he was historicizing the question is it self evident that people like the truth that people are motivated by the truth Suppose I said to you two plus two equals four. If I say two plus two equals four, you are obliged to believe two plus two equals four, right? If you don't believe two plus two equals four, you are probably being irrational. You are probably not being an agent. You know, you are doing something irrational, right? Suppose you were to turn to me and say, actually, you know, if you say I am obliged to believe two plus two equals four. i think that's a coercive act on your part there is an inherent coercion in the authority that truth claims right the way in which i manifest my freedom right is by actually performing whatever it is that i wish to perform unconstrained by any authority including the authority of truth itself right we like to think in 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 let's say the discourse of identity that identities can be performative are performative right the very act of enacting them creates them right just like the very act of making a promise creates the institution of promising but suppose that performative performativity of freedom extends to almost all our social life right and i think one of the interesting things about this time is the liars or whom we think of the liars the propagandists the aesthetic fascination with them despite our unmasking of their lies is that they seem to be oddly unconstrained right they might turn around and say what's so great about being sticking to truth i am performing whatever it is that i wish to perform right so the aesthetics of a certain kind of cheap freedom right is far more alluring than the authority of truth right you almost need a different kind of psychological and aesthetic response when faced with the kind of lying and u turn that you see in our politics 
they are enacting what exactly all of us are fighting, fighting for, freedom, right? They'll say we are even more radical than you are, right? Okay. And remember, Arendt's claim, politics is fundamentally about aesthetics in some ways. So the freedom constituency, it's not self-evident why you want to care for the truth. Perform whatever it is you want to perform. Performativity is the truth. The second constituency, you might say, so, you know, the relationship between truth and freedom turns out to be problematic. The second constituency, you might say, should care about the truth. Places like universities, right? Places that care, that care about validity claims. Think of the institutional crisis afflicting these spaces. spaces. During the rise of political economy that Krishna Bhagavad spoke about, the 18th and 19th century rise of the public sphere, one of the great hopes of modernity was that besides the market and the state, right, the state has the logic of power, the market has the logic of market exchange, the third most important sphere of modern collective life will be the professions. I'm leaving out the family, the private sphere, the intimate sphere for a moment. Why the professions? Because it will be the one sphere of life, right? Where your authority rests on certain validity claims that you make. Why are you a doctor? Because you have, quote unquote, a certain competence. You might be able to make money of being a doctor, but the ground on which you stand is validity. Right? It's not true of the market, preference, not true of the state, power and democratic legitimation. Right? It is these spheres, right, the universities, the professions in some ways, which would be in a sense this antidote to both the market and the state. Which is why we claim autonomy. When universities claim autonomy, what is the ground? Right? The ground is our validity claim should not be contaminated by either the logic of the market or the logic of the state. Right? They're subject to no calculus other than the internal truth claims they raise. Now, when you think about the crisis of the universities at this point, what is striking is not just the crisis of the university. Globally, not just in India, every single profession is facing that crisis of legitimacy, where the idea that this autonomous sphere, which stood its ground because it was arguing on the basis of some validity claims, is no longer carrying out their function. Some of that is for structural reasons, and there the logic of the way you structure private incentives in all matters. Obviously, if doctors are shareholders in a hospital, does it make doctoring a profession in the same way, based on validity claims, rather than the logic of the market? So some of that questioning is structural. Right? But I think what is striking to a degree which you know, many of Krishna Bharadwaj's interlocutors would have been surprised by, is every single profession has this crisis of legitimacy. Right? So the decline of the professions broadly, those custodians of validity claims, our authority is zero, right? The crisis in the university is not just what happens, what's happening inside universities, is globally why people have stopped caring what's happening inside universities, right? What is it about our modes of self-presentation that we cannot no longer carry those validity claims? So that sphere is gone. Uh, I'll just quickly run through a couple of more things. Uh, democracy and partisanship. Arendt knew, most of all, uh, she had reconciled to liberal representative democracy uh, in the hope, very much so, that as a counterweight to Jacobin democracy, as a counterweight to totalitarian democracy, at least this form of democracy will be able to avoid the worst evils and the worst kinds of cruelties societies are subject to. Right? But these democracies are organized on principles of partisanship. 
it is inherent in the structure of competition just like marx argued it's inherent in the structure of competition that you will get a market logic of competition right what is the political equivalent of that in a partisan democratic world right can a partisan democratic world ever be reconciled with the prospect of making a world together in common right or is a partisan democratic world always confined to the idea that knowledge is ultimately made for cutting down your opponents it is not made for mutual understanding right so something about the structure of democratic partisanship and remember these are all things we like freedom partisanship right identity and reason right uh identities matter should to people identities should matter to people they should be free to create whatever identities they wish under conditions of their own choosing right but i think arendt's profound insight that unless identities are made as background facts right so there's a certain kind of facticity to it you know you are whatever you are whatever you wish to call yourself right they are not legislated they are not compulsory right the logic of validation can never take home right the minute you profess your argument right this argument comes because i am x y z right the logic of identity cannot under in any circumstances be reconciled with the logic of validation and truth right as i said this does not mean identities don't matter even for justice they have to be taken into account but if politics becomes a display of identities and a performative identity all the way down and i don't just mean ethnic identity often our political identities even our ideological identities right are a kind of performance the kind of thing that krishna bharadwaj warned against right okay. so again another thing we value freedom democracy partisanship identity and finally arendt's big concern about politics which is the impact the distinction between the public and the private has on politics arendt is often accused of putting questions of the economy into this realm of labor right that's not political questions those are social questions those are economic questions and certainly she gets that distinction wrong of course economic questions are profoundly political questions but the thought she had in mind was suppose all social interactions in politics also began to partake of exactly that feature that you associate with economic exchange namely you have agents that are driven only by incentives and interests is any communication actually even possible right okay so her worry was that both truth and legitimacy will fundamentally be instrumentalized if they are reduced largely to economic questions and our dominant social science thinking promotes that if indeed everything is about incentives right okay what is the point of communication when we we, we can just have a strategic interaction right back to that sense of vertigo that we kind of talked about right but and this is the thought i want to kind of end with i think the two last kind of challenges are in conception or worry about the relationship between truth and politics poses for dark times is aren't also thought quite rightly that if you believe in a public private distinction and a public private distinction not just a public private distinction a distinction between spheres spheres of validity and so forth matter for politics the one thing you will not pay too much attention to in politics is hypocrisy okay why 
As Julius Klar argued very profoundly, hypocrisy is a very good tool of psychic warfare. Right? It's the easiest way of cutting down an opponent. Almost all our public argument is an argument about hypocrisy. Right? Left accuses right of hypocrisy, right accuses left of hypocrisy. Right? But arguments about hypocrisy are fundamentally corrosive of truth. Why are they fundamentally corrosive of truth? A, because there is no one in society that can fundamentally escape charges of hypocrisy. Right? That's what it means to live in an in, in imperfect society. Right? If you make unmasking of hypocrisy the objective of intersubjective truth, right? what you have done is, in a sense, delegitimize the credibility of every single political actor. Right? And remember, truth depends on trust. So the concern with hypocrisy, rather than the concern with validity of arguments, Right? is a deep psychological affliction that makes, again, communication impossible. Right? And finally, and this is the last sort of thought, which is Arendt's biggest worry about society, and that's, that's the final sense of dark time, is if you add all of this together, Right? The, the aesthetic allure of freedom as a kind of nonchalance about the truth, let's put it this way. Right? The aesthetic allure, the thrill of partisan combat. Right? The easy victory you can get by unmasking somebody else's hypocrisy. Right? It's the easiest argument to win in this world. Right? Here I say nobody can escape the charge of hypocrisy, almost nobody, in some ways. Right? The comfort of a compulsory identity. Right? If you put all of this together, is it going to be any surprise that politics becomes a kind of aesthetic performance, not fundamentally oriented towards mutual understanding? Right? One of the things she presently points out, actually, I mean, it's really quite remarkable if you actually read her work, is often there is a temptation when people in power do cruel things, when people in power do absurd things, when people in power violate our rights. We not only object to them morally, as we should, we also often turn them into objects of caricature and satire. Right? We turn them into fools. Right? It's a it's 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 a great way of delegitimizing their authority. Right? But Arendt had this astonishingly prescient warning, which was that if you turn agents of cruelty, if you turn holders of power into fools, do you at the same time risk making them a source of entertainment? Now her concern was right, that the very idioms in which we critique can turn back on us because the aesthetic allure of entertainment is far more powerful that society of spectacle if you like right, than the hard work of trying to come to a mutual understanding of truth. Right? At the risk of being a little simplistic, if you look at our politics, right, the sense of virtual intellectual vertigo you now feel, I mean, honestly, these days, feel, what is the point of saying? What is the point of writing? Right? Not because one should ever overestimate the power of saying and writing, but because there is a fundamental deeper vertigo at work. Right? which is you're doing this under conditions where there's a systematic chance you will be misunderstood. Right? 
where the things that we associate with, with, with communicative and with, with, the, with the romance of politics, building a collective life in common, right? That thing just seems to be almost like an impossibility, not a contingent impossibility, but you might almost say a kind of transcendental impossibility. Right? Now, what is the way out of this? This extraordinarily deranged aestheticism into which our political discourse has fallen, into which even our critique has fallen, right? We like critical thinking, but you know, critical thinking has also become a dogma with us. In the sense that the harder labor of politics and of universities is not critical thinking. Critical thinking is an enabling condition. It is, I think, as Krishna Bhardwaj would have reminded us, right? It is taking a certain kind of responsibility for arguments to try and figure the world out. Right? That's a far different mandate, far tougher mandate than critical thinking. One of the reasons society is suspicious for us is not because we are criticizing a particular government. There is an element of that. But that fundamentally the ground they see us occupying is this kind of ground of critique, right? Foucault in his great essay on, you know, Kant's What is Enlightenment, ends with this thought that enlightenment is perpetual critique. I would actually argue very strongly that is a very misleading characterization of what enlightenment means. Perpetual critique is an enabling condition. In Kant's essay, enlightenment is a good faith at, a, attempt to try and figure the world out. So the three things our politics will need at this point, right? Is one is, is in a sense a return back to you might say naive faith in enlightenment, which we have been the best at deconstructing, right? I mean, the enormous power our theory has had in creating a public culture. I won't underestimate that power. But the consequences are not what we had intended or in service of what we had intended. Right? The second thing is Arendt's, and this was, I think, Arendt's recourse to ancient Greek, not to revive ancient Greek polities, but to revive an ancient Greek idea of friendship, philia. Politics, politics should not be about eros, an erotic love relationship, like nationalism is in some ways. Right? Politics should not be charged, right, in a passion that seeks to possess the other, right? Politics is not even about truth in the sense that you come into politics thinking my version of truth should win, right? It is recovering that delicate art of friendship. What are the conditions under which you simply enjoy other people's company, right? Without assuming they will agree with you without having an erotic charge to their presence or without instrumentalizing them to your interest or purpose. Right? What is the subjectivity in disposition that produces that kind of politics? And the last and final thing, which you only briefly hinted at, but I think Gandhi got this right, which is the only form of politics that can work in the modern world if you take these, these prior constraints, is a politics of exemplarity, right? One of the interesting challenges, if you think of the space of legitimacy rather than the space of validity, is this very hard question, why do people trust some people? Why do all of us make so bad politicians, right? It's not simply because we don't have the money or the oratorical skills, we are super sophisticated in all those things. We can be, right? But what is it about that realm of legitimacy that it's drawn to certain forms of exemplarity? Sometimes good exemplarity, like Gandhi's, or sometimes a different kind of performative exemplarity that you see in a lot of the bad guys floating around, right? But the point about exemplarity that Arendt made was that for people to go along with you, for them to see you as a friend, right? 
friend in this political sense as a potential partner who I can communicate with, right? Not somebody who is an instrument of my desire or interest, right? Not somebody who I'll swallow in my identity, but as somebody who I can communicate with, right? What would have to be the qualities we possess for others to see us as that friend? The promise of 18th century political economy, in a sense, was that there will be that political economy, that sphere of interests and class interests and so forth. But there was this great aspiration that you could, in a sense, recapture, create some shards of a public sphere, right? Where a politics of exemplarity might be possible. Because the nice thing about exemplarity is that it doesn't claim authority. It says, look, what makes me attractive to you as an example is the fact that my conduct makes you trust me. Right? It does not even begin by saying what I'm saying is true. I mean, I can say, I can claim what I say is true, but if I don't have credibility in some other senses, if you don't trust me, right, my truth claims will not matter for anything. So Arendt's insight that the real darkness of politics that afflicts us will be almost in a moral psychological register, so subtle that we do not often see it. Right? So subtle that the dominant outward language of social science, class structures, economic interests, do not quite capture it. It will be the sense of being homeless in the world and without agency because the conditions under which you could be understood do not exist. Those, unfortunately, are the dark times we are in. But gatherings like this, I think, evoke hope that that kind of political action, a new form of friendship, right, is still possible. Thanks.